This is John Abrams, and this is The Variety Artist, episode 60. My guest and I have a lot in common. We were both anarchist clowns when we were younger. The only difference is he got paid for it and became famous. I just got in trouble for it. On to the interview. Welcome to The Variety Artist, providing aspiring artists and entertainers with in-depth discussions from top performers from all over the world. So get ready to book some gigs, make some money, and have some fun with your host, John Abrams. He was one of the original and one of the most memorable clowns for Cirque du Soleil. Variety artist, I give you David Shiner. Hello. How's it going, David? It's going great. Good. I have to tell you this story. It's strange when you interview some of your heroes, and you are one of my heroes. I know you don't know that yet. Let's go back in the time machine to November of 1994. I went and saw Cirque du Soleil for the first time ever. And I had heard about this thing. It's a circus with no animals and no animal acts. And I was thinking to myself, what could this be? I I don't know what this could be. So I go with my wife. We see this guy doing the cl- all the clown work throughout the entire show who was amazing and from that day on I, I went and bought the DVD or maybe back then it was, it was VHS I don't remember but I went and bought that and from that day on about the next five or six years you were my kids and my wife's and my favorite clown now wait a second it couldn't have been 1994 that was in New York or California it was in California no it was 1990 Oh, well, it was earlier than I thought. In 1990, and that was on the, the Santa Monica Pier. Oh, it was on the Santa Monica Pier. You're right. You're right about that. Yeah, that was 1990. Oh, how did you get involved in the Cirque? In 1985, I was I spent a short time in Los Angeles. I was contacted by Cirque du Soleil, by Guy La Liberté, and they mm-hmm. were in Toronto. And so they flew me out to look at their show. They had just started out. I spent a few days there and I said to Guy, well, you know, I'm not ready to do this now, but you know, let's stay in touch back again. Then in 1989, they asked me, look, we're doing a new show because they had just, uh, the first show was uh, Cirque Reinvente. They said, we're doing a new show and we'd love to have you. And I said, okay, great. So that was 1990. I flew over there. I think it must've been March. Mm-hmm. I think we opened that show. It was called Nouvelle Experience. And we opened that show, I must have been April or May. Yeah. And we did Montreal, Toronto, did Seattle, Washington, and San Francisco. You've stayed with Cirque and you've done some other things with them? Yeah. 2000, 2001 or something, 2002. Or, I was in Montreal doing something else. I met with Guy and Gilles St. Croix and I, I said, look, I, I, I'm really interested in doing a show. And directing it and they said okay let's do it and that was in 2005 i started working on that show kuza you know we worked on it for let me put it this way i started working on it in 2005 and we opened it in 2007 and it's still running oh is it is it here in the states or where is it no no they're they they just finished in new zealand and uh, or they're still in new zealand then they're heading off to spain so you directed it and let it go yeah, I always wanted to direct a Cirque show. I really, I really was really happy with the results. So how are those put together? Because I know I've seen a, a few of them, and they're act after act strung together with a clown or some, some act that ties the whole thing together. Is it written, or are you hiring acts, or how is that put together? Well, every director is different. I mean, some directors will probably write everything and down that they want to do and even have sort of a, uh, a storyboard drawings and stuff like that i had a general idea what i wanted to do but i I, first i wanted to get the artists that i wanted in the show once we had all the contracts signed i started to think about you know what kind of story it would be because i knew who i had in the show Mm -hmm. so during the rehearsal process which was about almost six months it started in september october november december january yeah at least six months during that period of rehearsals that's when i started to think about the concept and the story and all of that. Did you write it and put it all together? Yeah. Oh, nice. But you know, I don't write things down. I have an assistant. What I do is in a rehearsal, I'll get an idea and I'll try it out. And I just keep doing stuff like that. The most important thing for me is first to get some kind of through line because 
when you're doing a Cirque show, you cannot make a complex story. It has to be simple enough for the audience to understand because you can't really have a, a story in the real sense of the word. Yeah, you can't have a, a complex like play story. No, because the, the acts are always going to interrupt the, the flow of the, uh, the story. Right. You have to make it simple, but, it, but at the same time, you need to make it good enough so that the audience can follow it and they actually enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did. I found a good through line. I found a good idea for a story. I knew that I wanted to have certain characters that I always wanted to see in a Cirque show. And I always wanted to also do, to show the dark side, like, you know, have death and skeletons and things like that. Well, I haven't seen this one. Does it take a dark turn? Yeah, it's great. Oh, I'm sure it's great. <laughs> But, you know, and Guy was great. Both Guy and Jill, you know, the, the whole company there, they, they, they really let me do what I wanted, which was extremely commendable for that company. That's what Guy wanted from the, in the very first day. He wanted to let his artists, give the artists their freedom and to focus everything on the artists. And whenever he had a director come in, I think the first one was Franco Dragoni. In those days, though, like when we were doing Nouvelle Experience, we were all chipping in ideas. Mm. I basically wrote the story for that, the through line. My character was a through line for that. I came up with the story and it came up with the ending of the show. And Your character is hilarious. Is, this, is, that, is that a clown character that you had done previously on the streets? Yeah, that was what I developed in the streets, yeah. Well, let's talk about your early days clowning in the streets. Is, what, did you start on the streets of Paris? Well, no, I actually started on the streets of Boulder, Colorado. Oh, I was working as a carpenter for about 10 years and I, I was always wanted to do theater, you know, and I studied theater for a while in school, but then, you know, I needed, of course I needed to work to earn money. Yeah. I was really enjoying carpentry. So I was building houses in Boulder. They had just built the Boulder mall, this walking mall right down the center of main street. Mm -hmm. And one day I was walking down the mall and I saw this clown, a mime from the, uh, oh, who was the teacher then? It, uh, he had a mime school. Samuel Avital had okay. a mime school in Boulder. And I believe he, living in France, I, I, I don't know. I, I could be wrong. Okay. But he had, a, he had a mime school. And I saw this guy, and he, he had money in his hat. I really loved what he was doing. I thought, Jesus, I, I, you know, I want to try that. The next weekend, I went out and tried doing stuff. Oh, you know, and I was awful. I, I remember, I think I, I dressed up like Marcel Marceau. I had like these yellow pants and a, a blue striped shirt. And, a, you know, I tried to make a hat like his and put a flower in it. I mean, I looked ridiculous. <laughs> you know, people would walk by and go, this is the worst mime I've ever seen. <laughs> okay. And I, I mean, I was really awful. But I kept doing it because it was fun. And then I just started going out in the evenings on weekends. I couldn't get a crowd on this night. The streets would cross uh, the mall. You know, cars would go through. This one evening, the cop car came. And so I just went out in front of him, the, the car, and stopped him and opened his door and made him get out and frisked him. And so, you know, he played along. <laughs> and then I got in his car and I started to drive away. And, of course, he, he kind of freaked out. Then I got out of the car and there was about 100 people watching. Oh, you, you said, oh, I might have something here. Exactly. I went, oh, okay, I've got to start working with people. So that's what I started to do. And that's what got me, you know, you know, working with people, improvising with them and playing with them and involving them in stories and stuff like that. Right. Uh, I do the same thing. I always have volunteers on, my, on stage with me. It's much more fun when you have somebody up there reacting to what you're doing. It, it, it depends. I mean... I did it for so long that I, I don't, I think the next show I do, I'm not going to have any audience participation. I, it's like I've, I've done, I'm done with it. It served me well. I love doing it, but it's exhausting. The last show that Bill and I did, I did the cinema number again, but I changed it, made it a, the old West a saloon scene. Those people that are listening that don't know the cinema scene, you're talking about this the kind of silent movie. Yeah, the sound movie. Yeah. Routine. It, it, it's a hilarious, fun, fun routine. It's on YouTube. You can catch it on YouTube. It's, it's great. But after that was over, we played that, I guess, for about four months, the show. And I said to Bill, I said, that's the last time I'm doing that. I, he said, why? I said, it's exhausting, Bill. I can't. It's just too much stress for me at my age to be up there. And, you know, in order to make a number like that really, really funny, you've got to be improvising 
constantly and you need to be very aware of how the people feel. You know, you're working on so many different levels. If you really want to reach the kind of laughter that, that, that I wanted to have, yeah, um, you need to be 100% present and focused. And it's just, man, it's just exhausting. It's mm-hmm. exhausting. I said to Bill, well, you know, if I didn't have to do that act, I could do what we're doing for a year. But that act just kills me. It's just too much work. Hmm. You know, you're, you're constantly improvising, you're constantly having to come up with, you know, new ideas. And, you know, sometimes you get people that, that are out of control or not working with you or so many things can go wrong and, and you've got to fix it right away. Right. For anyone who plans on doing audience participation, I would suggest if you can do something good without audience participation, definitely go that way. Oh, not because it's a bad thing. It's just, it's really hard to do. To be good at it, you really need to know a lot about people, a lot about yourself, and you need to know something about psychology. You need to know, you need to know a lot about people. The only way I could get away with being really aggressive and mean and nasty to people was because <laughs> I actually really like people. For me, it was like being in the living room with my brothers and sisters. You know, mm-hmm. I have seven brothers and sisters, and to try to you know get that kind of intimacy as as quickly as possible. And uh, also trust, to get their trust, win their trust as quickly as possible. So that they, they go, oh, well, he's kind of, you know, he's harmless. Not only he's harmless, I kind of like him. And yeah, do whatever the hell you want with me. That's the key. How do I win their trust, their trust in, the, in, in, in the matter of a few minutes? That's, mm-hmm. that's the challenge. How did you go from Colorado to working in Paris? Well, yeah. So, yeah. So, so I started doing this on the streets, of, you know, on the weekends in the, on the Boulder Mall. And I, mm-hmm. I started getting crowds and it started to work. One weekend, these two guys showed up, juggling duo, Dr. Hot and Neon, they were called. They had a great show. And I talked to them after the show and I said, well, where are you guys from? And they said, oh, we just got back from Paris. You got to go there, man. It's really cool. The art scene is great. You know, you can go to the streets. The cops don't bother you. And I thought, Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. Then in October, I was headed to Paris. Wow. So you went directly from working in the streets of, uh, of Colorado right to Paris? Yeah. I quit my job and just flew to Paris. <laughs> That's great. But no idea what the hell was going on. Um, I had you know, a few hundred dollars in my pocket. Uh, I had two suitcases, one with my costume and props, and the other one just with my clothes. And um, I ended up in some horrible hotel somewhere and near the Bastille in this dark dank room and I said to myself what the hell are you doing here I mean you're all alone what are you doing how are you going to start what are you doing uh-huh. so you know I just went to the places I heard where they're doing street art street stuff and uh, that was Beaubourg, Saint-Germain-de-Pré, uh, Léal, Montmartre these different places and I spent most of my time at, at Beaubourg, Georges Pompidou Center because it had a huge place in front of the museum, huge. And uh, there were quite a number of artists that would work there. But it was kind of a mafia because these were a lot of artists that had been there for several years. And so they didn't like newcomers. Ah, the new guy on the block. Yeah, new guy. They didn't like newcomers. And so they would do their best to chase you away or, you know, scare you and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But I kept coming back, you know, started getting these humongous crowds because I was, I was kind of really into anarchy you know the clown is anarchist i would do anything and everything mm-hmm. when i worked at uh, saint germain de Pré, i would literally go into the street and stop traffic take someone out of their car and put them in somebody else's car <laughs> that's great like if a guy was on a date i'd just take his girlfriend out of that car and put him in the car with uh, you know where only one guy was sitting oh yeah you know or i'd, I'd take a raggedy ann doll and cross the street and the doll would have, have a heart attack and you know, I'd stop traffic, you know, because my doll was, you know, I had to give her CPR and horns would be honking. And I was just crazy. That is crazy. I'm totally crazy. And I would do anything. That has its limitations too. I realized I needed to just stay off the street and out of the traffic before someone killed me or I was arrested and put in jail. Yeah, you think? Uh, or if I caused an accident. I mean, anything would have happened. Yeah. And then I started really just really improvising with people. That was my thing. I get a big circle of people, about 100 or 200 people, and just start improvising and playing with them and doing different stuff and trying, trying all these ideas that I had. 
that was like 1981, 82. And that's when I started to develop the cinema routine. So by the time you were doing it with Cirque, you'd already been doing it for seven or eight, nine, 10 years, right? Yeah, like eight years. But I, yeah. no, I stopped doing it. Oh. Because I always considered it a street act. So I didn't do it in the circus. I didn't do it in Roncalli. And I didn't do it at the Circus Knee. Hmm. Then in 1990, I thought, wow, man, I should try doing the cinema in the circus. I wonder, because I had this stupid concept in my head that it's a straight act. Yeah. It's a straight act. But I tried it and I, you know, I had to make props for me, you know, a nice camera and clapboard. And I add all, added all these props to it, the door and everything. Sure. And it just became a, you know, it was a massive success. It was just great. The rest is history. Yeah. So what else did you do on the street uh, once once you decided that uh, the anarchist clown wasn't the wasn't the way to go stopping people on the street getting run over and all that? Like I said, I get these big crowds and improvise. I would you know like if a woman had a baby in a carriage, I would give the woman you know uh, you know like ten francs and take the baby and you know <laughs> sell it to somebody else. Or uh, oh, no, if there's some motorcycle guys hanging around, I'd put on a leather jacket and go over and try to start a fight with them. And, you know, and I would never pass the hat. I just leave it in the center of the ring after the show. My shows were about 20 minutes, uh -huh. you know, and then when kids came out to put money in, I'd always improvise with the kids. Like I would take a kid and he'd like put a franc in, I, you know, I'd grab him, put him upside down and shake him, like trying to shake more money out of him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember one time I did this to a kid and it was hilarious. These little toy trucks fell out of his pocket, balloons, and all of this stuff kids have in their pockets. Whoever was there, I just, I played with it. I tried to invent something. So that, that was kind of your uh, character is, is, is messing with people on the street. Yeah. You know, working as a clown, you develop your character, you know, over the years, you, the character changes. Mm -hmm. The clown that I had was on the streets. He was kind of a wise guy. And then my first year in the circus, I tried to make him sweet. And I look at those videos today and I go, God, that really sucks. I, oh. I looked so, it was so contrived. And that's when I realized like, to be a good clown, all you have to do is be yourself. You have to be able to move well. Yeah. You have to really learn pantomime. You have to have good ideas. But above all, you just need to be yourself and don't invent a character that's going to be doing something that has nothing to do with who you are. Mm. It's, it's not authentic. It doesn't have near the power. I think of it as an actor playing the part of a clown. But it's me that's doing it. It's just David acting like an idiot. It's David having fun. It's David doing different stuff. If I do a different character, then I, I show the audience now I'm playing a different character. You know, it's either a tough guy or it's a, it's a, uh, it's a crooner or it's a, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a motorcycle dude or it's this or it's that. Right. But I always come back to it's just me doing stuff. Yeah, when, when you're yourself, you add depth to the character. Because you think to yourself, how would I react? Well, here it is. I teach um, acting students here in Munich. And I, I, I always keep saying to them, guys, authenticity, authenticity, authenticity. Stop mm -hmm. pretending. You know, don't fake it. Just relax and use your own voice. And uh, it's a long road to the point of mastering something where you go, man, God, I can really do this well now. This really works. I understand who the character is. You realize you have really good movement. You can tell stories without speaking, you know, to be a storyteller. I mean, there are great clowns, really good clowns. They have great acts, but they don't know how to, they can't tell stories. Mm. And that's something I loved about Bill Irwin was when I first saw him, I got, you know, at, at the end of the day, this guy's a great storyteller. Bill Irwin is your, your uh, writing and your writing partner that you've performed with in a number of different shows, right? Yeah. And he's, for me, he was the best. He is the best. The story, there's a good story about our meeting because when I was working on the streets, a woman from the New York Times showed up and was writing an article on street artists in Paris. She interviewed me. Mm -hmm. And then during the interview, she asked me if I knew Bill Irwin. I said, no. She said, oh, it's this is amazing clown in New York City. He's become a huge star. You got to see him. She said, you know what? I actually have a video. If you want, I can show it to you. Yeah. And so she showed me the video of, of in, in regard to flight, the show that Bill was doing. And when I saw him, I, it wasn't even live. I just saw him on a video. I just went, oh, this guy's brilliant. And this is the best thing I've ever seen. What the hell am I doing on the streets? I got to get off the streets. Uh -huh. My dream was to meet him 
Oh, like if I had a vision of where I wanted to be, you know, in a few years, it would be with Bill Irwin on a Broadway stage. You know? <laughs> and it came true. It did come true. Meeting Bill was, you know, one of the highlights of, of my life. And then to work with him and to, you know, share the stage with him for so many years, I learned so much. When you guys met, do you just immediately hit it off and started writing together? How did that all? No, it happened like this. We started, uh, you know, we met. I, I was doing Cirque du Soleil in New York, and he came to see the show. And I, I was looking through the curtain that evening, and I, I said, Bill Irwin's in the audience. Mm-hmm. And I said to one of the ushers, I said, uh, after the show, pre- please make sure you bring Bill Irwin backstage because I want to talk to him. Bill came, and I said, oh, I'd love to meet you. And he, Can we have coffee tomorrow or something? He said, sure. He invited me over to his office and we went out and had lunch together. We went back to his office and, you know, he had these hats, clown hats all over the place. Mm -hmm. His office was full of clown stuff. And I found one hat and I put it on and looked at myself in the mirror. And, and a day later when I, at the hotel, I, uh, someone was at my door and they, someone from the hotel with a package for me and uh, I opened it up and it was the hat that I had tried on at Bill's office. Oh, okay. He said, you looked really good in this. I thought you should have it. I thought that was really cool. But a few months later, we get cast in a movie together. Oh. Sam Shepard's Silent Tongue. We played a couple of medicine show clowns. Mm -hmm. Sam Shepard said, well, you know, you guys can do whatever you want. And I, you know, we said, okay, well, let us rehearse. We started rehearsing ideas and it was like, it was like butter. It was like we were meant to be. Mm. I would have a reaction to what he did. He would have a reaction to what I did. It was so good that at some point we stopped and realized the entire set was watching us. Okay. Everybody. During the shooting of this film, I was asked to do the Serious Fun Festival at the Lincoln Center. I didn't have a solo show, so I asked Bill if he, if he wanted to do it with me. He said, well, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know. He said, well, let me think about it. A week later, he says, yeah, okay, well, let's try it. There was also a band in the, uh, in the film, the Red Clay Ramblers. And I said, well, let's have the, the Ramblers play the music. And he said, okay, why not? So we went to the Serious Fun Festival. We did two evenings. I did some of my stuff. Bill did some of his stuff. And we had developed, I think, one routine together that we did. It was a huge hit. You know, I think six months later, we were on Broadway. Oh, wow. Doing Full Moon? Yeah. Now, is that something you wrote? Yeah, both of us. So you went from uh, barely meeting, doing the movie together, and then being on Broadway in six months or seven months? Yeah, something like that. Wow. How was Broadway? Oh, it's, Broadway's fun, especially if you're a big uh, hit. You're sort of the talk of the town. You know, you can go into restaurants and they know your name. They give you a table. You know, you get to meet all the other really great talent that's in other shows. You get to hang out with those people. And yeah. And of course, the fans are a lot of fun and signing autographs when you come out of the theater. I mean, what can I say? It's it's Broadway. It's It's Broadway. And you're just, you know, you're in New York City and you're the talk of the town and uh, you're working with an artist that you've always worshipped. It it doesn't get any better than that, period. Well, I hate to bring up something uh, awful. Tell me about, I don't even know if it's awful or not. You tell me. Uh, tell me about Seussical, the musical. You played the cat in the hat. That was a weird thing because I got a call from an agent in New York. He said, David, they're doing Seussical, the musical, and they want, you to, they want you to audition for the cat in the hat. Mm-hmm. And I said, look, I can't sing, and it's ridiculous. I can't sing, so no. Yeah. He said, no, you should really try, you know. And I said, no. You're like, I barely talk in my act. Wait a minute. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> you want me to sing? Right. So I kept calling back. And then he, I said, okay, look, I have to go to New York anyways. I'll come by and, and, you know, go into the audition. And I thought I'd just do it on a lark and have some fun and just see what it was like to, you know, audition for a musical. Mm-hmm. Never thinking they would give me the role. And they did. Oh, so, you know, I had to take singing lessons and all that stuff. Were you the first cat in the hat for Seussical on Broadway? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was quite daunting for me to be on stage with all of these musical people who could actually really sing and had mm-hmm. amazing voices. We're all stars in their own right. And I was just this clown that showed up. 
you know, I had my hands full. I managed to find a way to, to sing and get away with it. And it worked. The show wasn't a big success because it uh, was just overly produced. Mm. It had lost its simplicity. It, it had lost its, in, it lost its innocence. At the end of the day, not everything's a hit. Uh, I, had a, I had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun doing it. So, so how did that end? I don't know. I left early. I think they brought in this woman who had a talk show. Uh, what was her name? Uh, Rosie O'Donnell. Oh, yeah. To play the cat in the hat. Oh, okay. It just didn't work at all. You know, they sold tickets, but it was, it was awful. Mm. If, if, I, if it's one positive thing I can say, I, I can say this. It was an honor to work with all of these really incredibly talented dancers and singers. Composer and uh, lyricists were brilliant. The director, choreographer, I mean, just really top people. That was, that was something to observe and, and participate in and uh, be a part of. All right, so we're going to move on to fact or something John just made up. Sound like some fun? Yeah. Is it fact? Or is it something John just made up? Ah. I'm going to say a headline, and you're going to tell me whether it's true or not. And if it is true, tell me a little more about it. Okay. All right, here we go. First headline. David once wrestled Roseanne Barr to the ground on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. True. Okay, tell me about that. Well, I don't know. You know, was just that was my thing was including people and doing crazy stuff. I wish the camera had stayed more on Bill because he was doing some really hysterical stuff. Oh, I didn't think it was much of a big deal. It was <laughs> well, it is a big deal because if you watch the video and anybody listening to this, watch that video because because uh, David climbs on Jay Leno's shoulders, right? Yeah, and wrestle Roseanne Barr to the ground. It's crazy. You know, that's the, that's the stuff I do. That's the stuff I did in Full Moon. You know, just bother people. All right, we're going to go to the next headline. Okay. David broke his left kneecap performing an off-Broadway show and finished the show. Uh, no. I did tear a um, meniscus oh. during the Cirque show because they had put a light film of coca-cola on the stage they were trying to have the for the acrobats so it would be a little more sticky mm -hmm. but they didn't tell me about it so i went out on stage and just want to turn and my my leg turned but my knee didn't Ow. So I, I tore my meniscus and i had to work on that for two weeks like that that was not fun next headline last headline during a midlife crisis uh, david bought a huge motorcycle It's true. Yeah, that was really stupid. Because I, I always loved motorcycles. And uh, for some reason, a couple of years ago, three years ago, I bought this motorcycle. I, Norton was a really, it's like the icon. Not everybody knows what a Norton is. Real motorcycle people know what a Norton is. Norton Commando, English bike. But some guy bought the name Norton and decided to build new ones. So I bought one of these. It was like a thousand cc's, but it was in Switzerland. You could only get them in Switzerland. It was up on a mountain. This guy had a big motorcycle shop on this mountain. So I drove there and I wanted to test ride one of them. So I took my helmet, my, you know, my gear with me. I thought, well, you know, I think I'll try the Cafe Racer. They had two styles, Cafe Racer and the normal. Cafe Racer, the bars are lower. Mm -hmm. You're basically laying on the bike. Okay. And it's for going really fast around corners. And, you know, it's built to just go really fast. I really thought I was cool. Like, yeah, man, I, I can do this. And uh, so I got on the bike. The thing weighed a frigging ton. So I started heading down this mountain. And I noticed my wrists were hurting, really hurting. And I realized, you're too old for this, man. You know, because when you sit on a cafe racer and you're, lying, you're laying on the bike, a lot of your weight is going into your wrists because the bars are low. Oh, okay. So that's when I realized, Man, you're too old for this. You got to stop. This is absolutely, are you nuts? Get off this motorcycle. <laughs> but I thought, okay, let's turn around. So there was a, like a turn off area, just, you know, just a bit of grass and a road. And I went to turn off and I went too far to the edge. Oh no. And I went straight down. I went, oh, well, that's not good. 
So I'm sitting on this monster bike and it's just and I'm going, I can't move this thing. I can't back up. I can't go forward because I'll go off the mountain. What am I going to do? I can't get off it because it weighs too much. So I'm sitting on this bike going, oh God, man. And I'm the only one there. There's no cars, nothing. And you're stuck. I'm stuck. I'm stuck. I'm stuck because the bike is too heavy for me to back up yeah. and, and turn it around. It's way too heavy. So what happens? So I hear this little moped coming up the mountain. It's like a, <laughs> with a with the sound of a moped. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. And it's this Swiss kid, about 15. And he comes over to me. He sees that I'm, you know, I'm in trouble. He goes in his, in his Swiss German. Ach, ich glaube, Sie haben Probleme. I said, yeah, I do have problems. Oh, ich kann helfen. I can help you. I said, yes, could you please? So he gets in front of the bike and pushes me back. So it was humiliating. And so I, I rode this bike back up the mountain. Uh-huh. I thought, how far are you willing to go to prove to yourself that you you can really, you know, you're still in the fight. You're, you're, you're still in the game. And I realized uh, that's the end. I'm not going to stay in this fight. I could have died. That was back. Or something John just made up. Ah. So do you have a, a performer horror story for us? I, I was on the streets one day. I had, a, I had a, this plastic gun in Paris. And I was, you know, I would use the gun. It was a cap gun. And I would, you know, use it for different stuff. Yeah. I'd pull it out and rob people, take their money and pass it out to other people. I was doing this thing and this guy grabbed the gun. And he really thought it was a gun. Thought it was real and took me hostage. Oh no! He took me hostage. So wait, wait, wait. he takes you into the audience, or he takes you in? What, what do you mean? No, he, takes he, you hostage? he grabs me around, gets me in a chokehold, and is pointing the gun at people. <gasps> like you know, he's got me hostage. He was crazy. He was absolutely crazy. So he wasn't playing around. No. So how did you get out of that? Well, I just pushed him away, you know, because I knew the gun wasn't a real gun, so he couldn't hurt me. I have another interesting story. I remember one, one night I met this woman who came after the show and uh, she was kind of strange. I, I tried to keep my distance. And I was staying in this place. I don't remember where it was. It must have been a, I don't know. It was a hotel, I, I guess. No, it wasn't a hotel. I don't know where it was. Anyways, <laughs> okay. I, I wake up in the middle of the night and this woman is sitting in the chair across from the bed. Oh. I said, uh, excuse me, what are you doing here? Yeah. Well, I'm just here watching you sleep. Oh. It was so creepy. She <laughs> broke into my room and I, you know, she was, I was terrified. I thought, who is this? I'm just watching you sleep. Oh, that creeps me out. I was ready for, waiting for her to pull out a knife or something. You know? <laughs> but you meet some strange people when you're working in the streets. You meet a lot of wonderful people, but every now and then you meet a kook. So wait, back to the girl in the, in the room. So did she just get up and walk out or, or how did that end? No, I said, you have to leave. <laughs> I'm sorry, you, you got to leave. I mean, this is ridiculous. That's crazy. It was spooky. Yeah. But crazy stories, you know, I've been very fortunate. You know, a lot of bad things could have happened but when I was working the streets, but they didn't. It was mostly, you know, really positive and wonderful and a really exciting, beautiful time of my life. Being that age and being in Paris and being having that kind of freedom Whenever you needed money, you just go out on the street and do a few routines and uh, you'd have a few hundred francs. It sounds like a, w- a wonderful way to spend your youth. Well, yeah, you're, you're, you know, you're an artist, working artist in Paris. All right, so before I let you go here, do you have some advice for, for a beginner? We have a lot of beginners listening to this uh, the show. Advice for beginners, I would say, if you're really into clowning, train. If you can get into dance and learning mime. Mm. all the techniques of mime and the way that Marcel Marceau worked, learn all that stuff because it's invaluable for storytelling and especially for movement for your character. Also to have a goal, set a goal for yourself. I want to, I want to do this. This is what I call the, uh, your, your prime, what's your primal voice telling you? What do you, why are you an artist? Why, why are you doing it? What do you want from it? Uh, what's your voice telling you? What's, what's your message? Set a goal for yourself and, you know, keep, moving towards that goal what advice can i give just jump in the damn cold water and try to swim 
You know, just swim, you know, and it's, you're going to get knocked down. You're going to you get back up on your feet. You're going to get knocked down again. You get back up on your feet. It's a process of just getting the crap kicked out of you. Yeah. And still not giving up. Yeah. You stand up again and you try it another way. You try it this way. You try it that way. But really, at the end of the day, it has to be something you are extremely passionate about and you absolutely want to do it and you want to be successful at it. I'll let you go with that. Thanks, Dave. You're my show. Thanks, Sean. Take care. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> yeah, it was. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks, bye. Bye. A special thanks to all my listeners. Thank you. Without you, this wouldn't be possible. If you found this podcast valuable, share it with your friends on your social media. You can reach me at my email at john at thevarietyartist.com or you can join my Facebook group at The Variety Artist where you can ask me to ask questions of our guests. Now go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun. That's all for this episode of The Variety Artist, but your journey continues on our website. Go to thevarietyartist.com for more strategies, insight, and resources, as well as show notes on today's guest to assist you in your career. We'll see you on the next episode of The Variety Artist. But until then, go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun.